thank you for um, joining us uh, for this conversation today, uh, which um, shows, I think, the leadership of the Pardee Center in bringing together the various groups around the university, both campuses, both the medical campus in the South End and the Charles River campus, um, those of us who work on Africa issues. Um, when Adil asked me to do this, I said, you know, social development's a big issue, uh, and how are you going to do this? And, and Adil said, well, of course we won't cover everything, but I think what we've done, and I'm quite excited to hear from the panelists, is provide you some lenses, but I'm going to argue that they are some connected lenses. Because our first um, speaker, uh, Sable Dawit, who I'm going to welcome back to Boston, because in reading I realized was a Wellesley faculty member before we lost her to Baltimore. Um, you should come back. Um, um, is, is quite involved um, in peace studies issues, but also quite involved in gender issues. And for many of us, I think we would argue probably peace on the continent is a precondition for social development. Um, but our second speaker, um, Professor Dick Clapp, who's a colleague of mine from the School of Public Health and is an epidemiologist, is going to present some work on pesticide exposure and some health effects with a particular focus on women. So we go from peace with gender to health with gender issues. And then our third speaker, um, Nathan Eagle, who's um, uh, I'm not quite sure how best to describe a innovator who has figured out that you can use large computational um, science tools and really to think about technology to do some very creative ways to think about, as I learned this morning, to think about malaria transmission using cell phone coverage. Where are people with cell phones moving and how does that link to health? So across the three, for three very different people, as I think you'll, you'll hear, um, we can go from peace with gender, gender with health, health with technology, and so show some of the interconnections which make social development such a challenging and important issue. So with that sort of trying to frame it, they're each going to take about 12 to 15 minutes. What I'd like to do is at the completion of their presentations allow two or three minutes just for clarifications so that you can frame in your mind the questions for the discussion. But we'll, we'll allow just some clarifications at the end. We'll ask each of the three um, speakers to try and keep within their 15 to 18 minute time and then open it up for discussion. So with those introductory remarks, um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sable Dawit, who's now at Gaucher College, um, to present some work on the role of some peace studies issues in education on the African continent. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry I'm late. I didn't get a chance to mingle and talk and have coffee and breakfast with you. I was a little bit lost in Boston, so I don't know if I'm coming back to Boston. <laughs> um, my thanks to the Pardee Center for inviting me and to Heran Sarek Abraham, who's a friend of mine who um, I'm sure it had something to do with that. <clears throat> um, I'm the director of the Peace Studies program at Goucher College, and um, in the time that I've been there, which is about nine years, um, I've also taken um, some, I, I, in developing the program, I've had to look at uh, international programs that do peace studies because we have a requirement at the college for students to study abroad. Um, um, and and a, a lot of our students have an interest in studying abroad in Africa. And they, just, they don't sort of care where they study in Africa. They just want to be in Africa. And um, obviously, <clears throat> that's good. I don't have to convince them that Europe is not the only place where they can study abroad. Having said that, we need to get them into peace studies programs in Africa, which when I first started this job was a bit of a challenge. Um, so I, I did a bunch of research on uh, peace studies programs. Also, I had been doing this research back in 2001 before I, I took this position. And so today what I'm going to tell you about is uh, about academic peace studies programs throughout Africa. Um, and the, the reason that's good news, and I'll put it out front and center, for a number of reasons. One, um, it's good news because <clears throat> we need to diversify the academy first and foremost. We need to um, look and develop programs, look at and develop programs that are, and departments that are interdisciplinary. I think that um, 
interdisciplinarity uh, is important and is valuable and continues to be. Um, but I think interdisciplinary work is at the crossroads of, of disciplines is where um, our institutions and our students and academics need to be to uh, perhaps move us into the 21st century. I think it's a resource question. Um, I think it's a, it's a time and needs question. And so um, this particular interdisciplinary um, field, peace studies, is an important one. Also because of the conflict issues that we deal with, um, it, you know, the, the vast majority of peace studies programs, and I can't show you a number of um, slides that I have for you because we don't have internet connection in this room. Um, but I have this list I can show you, if you will, please, Elaine, the, the list. This is the, <clears throat> so this is a, a list of about 350 institutions, Elaine, if you just keep scrolling down till you get to the bottom. Um, compiled by one of the publications that I'm going to talk to you about today. And these are just institutions in the United States and Europe in, in the main with, I think, two African programs thrown in. And this list I found uh, back in uh, 2000. Um, this, is, this is quite a lot and, you know, a, a good 90% of these are American schools. So what I was doing is I was looking for um, some kind of compendium of uh, peace studies programs in Africa. Um, so the good news I'm bringing is about peace studies in Africa. What are peace studies programs? What do peace studies programs um, do? Uh, is not so much what I'm going to be spending time on. I'm happy to talk about it in the question and answer session. Um, OK, back to my PowerPoint, please. So th in terms of the structure of my talk, I, I'm not going to have probably time to cover all of it. but. Uh, that part was the peace studies uh, around the world piece. And the, type of, the types of degrees we're talking about, we're talking about the whole range. We're talking about undergraduate arts degrees. We're talking about undergraduate science degrees. We're talking about um, MAs, uh, MSEs, uh, DPhils, PhDs, all kinds of degrees in peace studies depending on the institution and depending on the um, trajectory of the program, the curricular emphases. Um, they are, the programs are as varied as, as, as institutions and as locations as you can imagine. Um, so, okay, so um, the curricular emphases also, if you'd please move forward, right, uh, right. Their curricular emphases differ from place to place as well. For instance, um, you have, you have uh, institutions that, um, uh, or programs that emphasize conflict and conflict resolution. And conflict resolution tends to be very, very dominant because the, it, it cranks out mediators. And there's a sense that, you know, as long as peace studies programs crank out mediators, there isn't a conflict that, that can't be resolved or transformed. And um, some of us have a little anxiety about that because the assumption is that we're always going to get on the, on the other, on the, on the after conflict or during conflict side of, of peace. And some of us, what we'd like to do is get on the before conflict side of peace. So the, the idea of cranking out mediators becomes a little bit more complicated. But it is a, a lot easier to offer some training and a degree and, and go off rather than sort of spend a lot of time on theoretical issues and peace studies. Um, other programs, um, look at peace and justice issues, so structural violence um, questions. Other programs will look at peace and education, which is uh, a very important um, subcategory in peace studies. It's about developing K through 12 education that has at its, at its core a nonviolence um, framework and to develop these programs. And um, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of work in that area um, in the United States, but also a lot, quite a lot in Europe. Um, and then another area is um, peace psychology, peace history, you name it. There are people who are doing it in, in um, different institutions and in different locations. OK. Um, these are three directories for locating peace studies programs. And, th and this is really what's available to faculty and to students. And you know, when I was doing my search, I was interested in 
how do we locate programs where um, people can study? Ultimately, at the core of my search, you know, beyond the interests and the needs of my students, was the, the need to replicate peace studies programs. And the first peace studies program I came across was <clears throat> the peace studies program at the University of Sierra Leone, which interestingly was running during the entire uh, conflict in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And you know, had students, except when you know, the school closed down for, for the reasons beyond the, the institution, um, the school continued to run. And it's a very interesting program. It has a Master of Arts in um, Peace and Conflict Studies. It has an amazing partnership, which I'll talk a little bit about later, with Bradford University in, in the United Kingdom, um, where they exchange faculty and they exchange students and, and uh, one supports the other. So that was the first one I came up with, and, and that was really the only one. And then there was another one later I found in uh, Nigeria, in Ibadan, called the Department of Iranology. Uh, which was really interesting. And Iranology apparently is peace studies, the study of peace. Um, and so I found it. And I found it in that uh, catalog, that list that I showed you earlier. But I haven't yet found it in Ibadan. So we, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Um, these three lists are variously useful or variously useless, depending on where you're coming from. Um, as I say, my objective is to help people and to help our students and to help myself locate peace studies programs and replicate peace studies programs. I want to proliferate peace studies programs. That's at the core. I'll be very, I'll just come clean. I want to proliferate peace studies programs and good, solid, concrete, theory-based, rigorous peace studies programs all over the world. And so I wanted to see how easy is it for people to find these programs, to study there so that in the process, you know, we have to create people who are going to run these programs. The first one, um, I had a link to it, I won't be able to show you, um, is, is the middling one. It's not bad. It is heavily Europe, so it's really a, a duplication of the American one, that I, the list that I showed you at first. Um, the last one is, is, the, is the list that I showed you first. It's been edited. It's got a new version, but it's abysmal on Africa. It's got something like five South African programs, the Sierra Leone one, which you, you can't really contact, and than the one in Ibadan, and that's about it. The UNESCO one, which is apparently huge and is much more than peace studies, is virtually impossible to search. So you need an additional degree to, to get in and search it. And if I could show you the link to the, to the search page, you would be amazed at how obtuse this thing is. And apparently, but I'm told that there's quite a lot in it. I found a little bit, but not very much um, in it. Yes, please. <clears throat> so, in terms of African peace studies programs, um, 2002, um, ACORD in South Africa and the University of Peace in um, Costa Rica got together and put together a, a, a questionnaire for African institutions and said, do you have peace studies programs, basically? Um, and uh, they, they asked, they wrote to about 360-odd institutions this questionnaire. Do you have a peace studies program? What does it look like? Do you offer degrees? Um, do you have dedicated faculty? Is it attached to another department, et cetera, et cetera? They asked these questions. They collected re their responses by country. They collated them by country. They did follow-up visits. Um, they did additional data collection. They clarified what they had. Uh, they held some consultations, advisory meetings, try to figure out really what kinds of categories of programs do we have? Um, how functional are they? Are they you know, little tiny certificate programs or are they full-fledged sort of departments um, that are freestanding, which are actually quite rare? Usually they tend to be inside majors inside of other departments. Um, and at the end of this, uh, they came up with 121 departments in 109 institutions in 34 African countries. And that was quite amazing. And this list, um, 2004, and I'm happy to give anybody uh, the URL who wants to look at this list, um, it's a very well done um, list of schools that is searchable in any number of ways. So very, very user friendly. It has a list of countries. You know, it starts from, I believe it starts from Algeria or Angola 
and goes all the way down to Zambia and Zimbabwe and um, quite a lot of countries listed and has gone to great lengths to represent not, not just academic programs, which is what I'm mainly interested in, but also institutes and centers working on peace. So to really try to uh, do a very well-rounded look at who's working on peace issues. Um, <clears throat> so um, the other thing that I wanted to share with you, which um, I, I'm afraid I won't be able to share with you, is some sample peace studies programs. And I can tell you what I would recommend you look at um, in terms of what a, you know, a really solid peace studies program looks like. One is um, Northwest University in South Africa. The other thing is when, when you're doing these searches, I mean, I travel and I get to see some of these programs, but when you're doing these searches, it's astonishing. Um, something as basic as a, as a website can be really, really challenging. And, you know, websites change, websites um, move, websites are channeled through, you know, for instance, as amazing as the University of Sierra Leone uh, program is, it doesn't have its own website. So you have to go through and search that enormous University of Bradford page to find anything on it. And then really what you're finding is Bradford's perspective on the sort of the Fora Bay College. Um, and so it's this, these little things, these little glitches need to be worked out, but these are ones that are easily accessible. Northwest University in South Africa has a Peace Studies and International Relations Certificate and Diploma Program. Um, it does a BA in Peace Studies and International Relations, which is different. It pulls poli sci together with Peace Studies. Um, a BA honors in that as well, an MA in that, and a, and a PhD in that. And you can search their website. Um, the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, which used to be the, um, or the University of Port Elizabeth got uh, married to the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, has an MPhil in conflict transformation and management. Conflict transformation is a sort of a new direction in peace studies, which is uh, really important. It's about, not just about resolving conflicts, but about transforming conflicts, sort of a little more longer term solution. Um, and then one where I've worked, um, used to be a human rights center, was funded by the government of Austria. Uh, worked, I used to um, sort of lecture for them and train for them years ago. It was at Makerere University in Uganda. And Makerere is in, now has a peace and conflict studies program. And it has an MA um, in peace and conflict studies, uh, an MA in human rights, and an MA in, in leadership and human relations, all coming out of that sort of early uh, human rights program. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. So in terms of future possibilities, um, obviously, I mean, we're here to talk about good news, and we're looking sort of 50 years into the future. And that, you know, that suits me just fine. It's, um, you know, peace studies is very young. You know, we spend a lot of time justifying our existence. You know, what is it you do? What do you do with peace studies degree and all of this? And so I'm hoping that in the next 50 years, I won't have to answer those kinds of questions so I can actually get to the, to the work of doing peace. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of partnerships, there are tremendous opportunities, um, both institutionally but also in t for individuals. And one of the things that I would like to see a lot more of is I'd like to see faculty and students in sort of the traditional disciplines doing some of their research and studying outside of their disciplines. So for example, um, obviously I'm, I'm skipping the institutional piece because I think that's, that's pretty self-evident. Um, but in terms of the institutional, uh, in terms of the individual piece, faculty who um, have sabbaticals coming up, who have possibilities for being seconded through um, their university or their organization to go and work in these peace studies programs, to do some research, to develop relationships, maybe to take their sabbatical in some of these peace studies programs, um, uh, to, to write fellowships that will get them into these peace and conflict studies programs. And for, for students, I think, you know, there's a lot, um, there are a lot of opportunities both in institutions that uh, American u uh, universities and colleges sponsor and have relationships with institutions in Africa, but also organizations that specifically do study abroad in peace and conflict studies all over the world. And I personally, I would like to see a lot more uh, work and, and, and research by undergraduate students and graduate students if possible 
um, to do study abroad work all over the world and to bring it back and to start making the connections because one of the, one of the difficulties we have is there's a sense that conflict happens somewhere else. Um, and it's very difficult, particularly for American students, the ones that I'm working with, to see the ways in which conflict happens in the United States, to see um, urban um, violence as, you know, from my perspective, a civil conflict. I mean, I live in one of the murder capitals of the United States, and I can tell you that it's a war zone. There are very few places in Africa where you have murder rates in peacetime the way you have in Baltimore. And so I really would like my students to start making the connection that um, so, sort of the conflict or the post-conflict situation or the conflict that took place in, in, in Sierra Leone in Freetown in a capital city with people being um, destroyed in capital cities is happening in other cities. What are the root causes? What are the structural issues that, that we're looking at here? Um, I think that's about all the time that I have. I'm happy to talk about the slides that I had for you and maybe to share with you some of the URLs. I urge you, I'm an advocate for peace studies. Um, that's, that's what I do. I'm, I'm, I urge you to look at some of the stuff and I'm happy to share with you those links. Thank you. Any questions for clarification before we go to our second speaker? If not, then um, I'm going to change the order a bit, if you don't mind, and, and ask uh, Dick Clapp, um, um, who is a colleague of mine from the School of Public Health, to present his work on pesticide exposure and particularly um, its role in women agricultural workers in South Africa. And I learned a good life lesson um, from Dick this morning. And I said, how'd you get started on this? And he said, well, it didn't come out of science. It came out of political work and the anti-apartheid movement. And I think that's an important reminder to us all that the opportunity to integrate um, both our, our professional work and our scientific work with the, the political issues that engage us um, socially are part of these lifelong um, commitments and relationships. So Dick, please. Thanks. Thanks, John. I'll, sit, I'll stand up here so I can actually see my slides as opposed to craning my neck. Um, and it's true, this is actually some work that began, I could, you could argue, in the 1980s. A colleague of mine from the Boston Committee for the Liberation of Southern Africa is, is sitting here in the audience. And so I now go back and forth, have gone back and forth to South Africa subsequent to the end of apartheid and during this transformation doing what I call uh, post-apartheid solidarity work, and in my case, it's teaching, teaching about public health and pesticide health. Um, and one of the colleagues that I've met uh, at the University of Cape Town, Dr. Leslie London, has taken this on as his life's work. Um, he, he actually was a medical doctor who was you know, trained to do traditional primary care and got interested in the problems of farm workers while working in a farm workers' health clinic in the Western Cape and then decided to go back and get a doctoral, in South Africa they call it a doctoral degree for somebody who's already a practicing physician, an MD. So he got an MD after he was already in, a, in the South African system, a practicing physician. So that's where I met him, he was actually a student of mine, and he was invited to give this talk. So he has subsequent to being a, uh, an academic and a researcher become the dean of the School of Health and Primary Care at the University of Cape Town. So he realized that it was crazy for him to try to come here in the midst of their semester and so forth. So I'm substituting for him my colleague and friend, Dr. Leslie London, and, so, and much of which I'll uh, be talking about has to do with um, work that he's done. Uh, I actually went to a conference in, uh, in East London in, two th in the year 2000 where Dr. London gave a presentation to, it was called the Epidemiological Society of Southern Africa, and he was introduced as Dr. Pesticide. So he's become renowned, I guess you'd say, for that. Um, so I'll, I'll mostly talk about work with uh, uh, colleagues at the University of Cape Town and also the what's now called Nelson Mandela School of Medicine to look at pesticide exposure to women who work in the, in the fields, farm workers, and their offspring to see whether the effects of pesticide on the women themselves and on the development of their children has been uh, has been adversely affected by, uh, by the pesticides that they've worked with. And they're, in that context, there are a lot of lessons learned around the world. And so both uh, people like myself from North America that come and work with uh, colleagues in Southern Africa, plus 
South-South collaborations that are already established and uh, where people share information from their stories in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, all of that is at work in, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal and, and other parts of Africa. Um, first, next slide. So this is a study that was funded by the Fogarty International Center, the former director of which is Dr. Jerry Kirsch here in the audience. Um, and it's an NIEHS, U.S. National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences uh, funding mechanism to do a pilot study on pesticide health effects um, in southern Africa. Uh, the pilot study that we did was in particular in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Next slide. This is a lot of words, but I'll try to tell you that, uh, some of which I've already said, that it's been well documented around the world and in South Africa that pesticides are a common uh, mechanism for committing suicide. There's lots of pet poisonings from pesticides that are accidental, but there's also a, a large number, hundreds of thousands of cases of uh, either attempted suicide or successful suicide around the world from the use of pesticides. So some of these are so toxic that they really can't be used safely, and some of them have been phased out as a result. Um, in the area that we were looking at in northern KwaZulu-Natal, there was soil contamination from decades, years and decades of uh, overuse of pesticides um, in order to increase crop yields. Some pretty large farms, actually, uh, with you know spraying that was quite extensive. Um, so, and then there's also, and this is an area where there has to be use of DDT to keep down the mosquito population because otherwise there wouldn't be anyone to work in the farm on the farms. Um, so, and that was done, you know, kind of in a in a uh, generic way or in a widespread way for years. Now the DDT control, DDT use for mosquito control, is much more limited and limited to houses, to bed nets, to spraying inside of uh, houses periodically, but not as widespread in the environment. Nevertheless, DDT, as you all know, is a very persistent chemical, so it's still there in the soil. Um, there are networks of colleagues who work on this uh, type of activity to try to reduce farm worker exposure. In East Africa, there was the East Africa Pesticide Network. It was based in Kenya, funded by the Finnish Institute for Occupational Health, um, which existed, had a newsletter actually for a couple of decades. Now that's shifted more to Southern Africa and to the colleagues at Cape Town also in Tanzania, uh, I'll show you a reference here to a colleague in Tanzania who does this kind of work, uh, both teaching and farmer field work um, to talk about ways to reduce pesticide exposure. There's a South-South network that exists and I actually had the privilege of going on a, on a tour in a farm near uh, Johannesburg in 2006, 2005, um, that included colleagues not only from Tanzania, I learned how to say Hujambo from one of the uh, colleagues from, from Tanzania. And then uh, India, Brazil, Costa Rica, as well as South Africa and North Americans. But the, the collaboration really was the South-South network that was, uh, and that was the reason for the meeting. Us North Americans were there to observe. And then there have been in Southern Africa and particularly in South Africa, a long series of recommendations and policy interventions to try to reduce the number of suicides to try to uh, move to safer, safer pesticides. Um, when I speak at uh, courses in the University of Cape Town, I talk about a Massachusetts law here. We call it the Toxics Use Reduction Act. Um, and so that's sort of a model for other countries, not so much at this point in Africa, but uh, beginning to look at ways to get the same product that, or the same effect from a product, for example, same agricultural yield, by using less toxic materials um, in, the, in the process of uh, growing crops. So that's an example of a policy intervention that can eventually, I think, take, take shape in Southern Africa. It, it's on the agenda, at least. Uh, and then meanwhile, just talking about the hazards and documenting the hazards and then doing farmer training uh, is, what, is what the bulk of the work has been. Now I'm going to show you a series of photographs that are mostly um, well, sorry, first is the list of the pesticides in the northern KwaZulu-Natal pilot study that were identified, DDT. Organophosphates is a long list of organophosphates, uh, which are basically weed killers. Carbamates, insecticides, and pyrethroids, which also tend to be used as insecticides. Those are widespread and m multiple 
co combinations of those are used depending on the crop. DDT is primarily for mosquito control, not for uh, agricultural use. And then a couple, couple of other less common um, diuron is a urea-based pesticide. I have an article which describes this in more detail, which is out on the uh, shelf. And this was written by my colleague, Dr. Leslie London, and then uh, another student of mine, actually, from one of my frequent visits to uh, do teaching there named Rajan Naidu, and then a colleague from the University of Natal, Nelson Mandela School of Medicine. These are the co-authors of the article that sort of describes some of these pesticides and their health effects and their classification uh, by the World Health Organization, for those of you who are interested. Next slide. So this is a slide that I took. This is women working in the maize field. Um, it's not perhaps so obvious uh, looking at this, but the woman who is second from the left with the purple bandana is pregnant. And so she's out working in the field. This is probably after pesticides had been sprayed um, on the crops, but where there's plenty of soil that's contaminated with pesticides. So the question is, and the, the question that we attempted to address in this pilot study was, what will the effect be on that woman's pregnancy and the development of her child um, as a result of pesticide exposure? And the goal of this is to say, well, if there are health problems, there are ways to do this same agricultural work with less use of pesticides, or there are protections that could be built in that would reduce uh, potential harmful effects. Next slide. Um, this is a woman actually in her home, and this is another practice that, that is a, a route of exposure. Um, these slides are basically about how people get exposed. Well, one way is in the fields, the other way is at home, but you may notice she has uh, soil on or, or clay on her face, and it's as a sunblock. So it's taking soil to put on your face as a sunblock. It's cheap, but it also is putting pesticides on your, on your uh, face. So it's a way of so-called dermal root of exposure. Next slide. Uh, these are pesticides that are used in the home. One is called Doom. I have a feeling that's not good for pests. Um, I can't read the other name, but in any case, the doom is, is a coil that you set on fire, so there's a smoke that keeps the mosquitoes at bay. Um, so again, another source of indoor exposure to pesticides. Next slide. And this is outdoors. Uh, again, I guess this slide doesn't show up too well, but some of these containers that are used to carry water are old pesticide containers. So that's another, and the pesticides are very, some of them at least, are very persistent, so they're still there along the sides of the containers that the water is being stored in. So that then when that water is either drunk directly or used in cooking, some of the persistent pesticides can be ingested that way. Next. Um, well, this is just a generic slide of a rondavel to say that uh, mosquito control uh, requ is required to use pesticides, um, DDT in particular. Um, there may be some eventually successful, less toxic but effective ways to control mosquitoes, but in certain parts of Southern Africa, I'm not here to say that DDT has to be banned everywhere. I think that's absurd. Um, and in, in this area particularly, it's such a problem that DDT is still used judiciously, I would say. Next. Yeah, this is just some more photos of the pesticides that I listed earlier. Um, we can, I think we have one, one or two more. Oh, and this is, this is the good news that um, if some of the you know, harmful effects of pesticides and the developmental effects of pesticides can be reduced, then these kids will have less damage done to them while they were young um, than, than perhaps has been true in the past. I'm not talking here about the big, the huge epidemic of HIV AIDS going on in Southern Africa. That has much more, I think, to do with these kids' future than control of pesticides. I'm not an expert in HIV AIDS. In fact, I think Dr. Simon and others here in this room can speak much more about that than I can. I'm just saying, from the work that I've been doing, we're trying to address this problem, the, the, uh, the issue of overuse of pesticides and some of their harmful health effects. One more. Ah, this is a great slide. It's my favorite slide, actually, but it doesn't show up. There's one little boy down here who was having an emergency nap. This is a crash, and so he was so tired he just fell asleep on the floor. But this is one woman in the back who's trying to do her best uh, in this. This is in northern KwaZulu Natal, and Makatini Flats is the area. Um, so anyway, this is the future. Some of whom are asleep right now, but eventually they'll wake up. Next slide. Um, wow. 
It's too bad these slides are so dark. But in any case, this is a uh, pediatrician who worked on this pilot project. He's actually he's South African, and he is doing a uh, what's called a finger tapping uh, test. He's, te he's showing this young child how to tap a, a uh, it's like a Morse code uh, electrical uh, device and see how quickly he can tap it. I think we probably can't do any better than that. It has to do with the projector, not with the lighting. Uh, and these slides, if anyone wants to see them, may be posted uh, on the Party Center website. But in any case, this is one of the neurological tests that's being done to see whether the kids that had the highest exposure, whose mothers had the highest exposure to pesticides, can't tap, <coughs> cannot tap the uh, device quickly as, as quickly as some child that did not have uh, uh, high exposure. This is a neurological, uh, childhood neurological test. Next slide. And this is Dr. Naidu, uh, Salashni Naidu, who was our, the first author <coughs> on this paper in our University of uh, Natal collaborator on this work. Um, and she's just doing an exam, taking this child's height. And he looks a little scared about it, but it, it's not invasive. Next slide. And this is uh, Lawrence, the pediatrician again, just doing a neurological, some kind of neurological exam. I think I have a last slide. Oh, this is environmental sampling. This is just people's backyards to see what's in the soil. This is part of this pilot study. And again, the lessons of this are communicated back to the people in the area as to uh, how, much was a, how much pesticide was found, ways to reduce exposure, interventions that might actually reduce exposure, and then what to think about how to do this in the future with less, use, less widespread use of pesticides. Um, this is the final slide. This is the team that, uh, it's not the entire team actually, but um, Lawrence is on the right. Lawrence Mubaiwa um, is the pediatrician. Right in the middle uh, are two women. Um, the woman, the shorter of the two, with the t-shirt with some language on it is Salashni Naidu, who is the co-investigator. To her, to her left, to the right on the slide, is Dr. Roberta White, who's the chair of environmental health and the assistant associate uh, dean, assistant dean for research at the BU School of Public Health, who was the principal investigator on this pilot study. Dr. Knight, uh, Dr. London is not in this slide, but he was also, he just didn't happen to be there the day this was taken. Uh, and then that's the team. It's an international collaborative effort. That kind of work will continue. Capacity building and collaboration between North and South universities um, in, in Africa has, has begun, is already underway. Uh, and I think that's more good news for Africa in the, in the coming years, is the, sort of the, the connectedness, especially South-South, but also global connectedness uh, of this kind of work. I think I'll stop there and take any questions you might have. Any questions or clarifications? Jared? Um, in the category of maybe uh, bad news for Africa, um, bad news, I think, is when you conflate the agricultural use of EPP and the medical use in the control of malaria. Um, and he did not make the distinction very clearly that one is maybe necessary, um, but certainly acceptable from a risk-benefit ratio, whereas the agricultural use is a disaster. And I think we need to be very careful about that because we very quickly go to the, we gotta get rid of all of these persistent uh, pesticides. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. In, in the area that we were working, there was no agriculture use of DDT, but I'm sure it's true elsewhere, and, and especially in cotton growing areas. Uh, so that's an important point. Um, DDT is on the POPs list, the persistent organic pollutants list. So it is phased, it is scheduled to be phased out, but uh, not, not quickly. There are several other more easily phased out. Uh, there are 12 original POPs pesticides in this international treaty, which George Bush even signed. Um, and so I think some of those pesticides are going out. And DDT is on that list, but it's, uh, it's there for, it needs to remain for other reasons. Yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, extend the comment just made now. I've been working in agriculture now in Africa for about 30 years. And the good news in terms of pesticides is that Africans are using more pesticides today than before. And the fundamental problem is that between 30 to 40 percent of the crops that most African farmers grow are lost due to uh, insects. 
So the increased use of pesticides should not be looked at as a bad thing, it should be looked at as a good thing if it's used properly. That's, and the key, th that's the key point, if used right. properly. But I think one of the problems we do have is we tend to look as a Western perspective as opposed to an African perspective of the use of pesticides. An example of this would be DDT, where Africans, when, where DDT was banned for many years to be used internationally, and the problem of malaria became extremely problematic, where over a million Africans were dying every year because they could not use DDT to control insects. Now DDT is being used properly, and the problems of malaria is becoming decreasing as an importance in much of Africa. So I think the problem here is we need to expand the use of pesticides wisely. And that's the more, uh, that to me is the good news for Africa. Well, this is what you wanted ideal, right? This, <laughs> expand the use of safe pesticides, I would agree with. Um, not the expansion of the, even sometimes pesticides that have been banned elsewhere in the world that are now used in West Africa, for example. I think that's, a, that's exporting a hazard and that's not to be, uh, uh, you know, continued. We can disagree later. I think actually Dr. Uh, London would be, have a lot to say to you. I wish you were here actually to answer those questions. Um, and here I am just sort of subbing for him. One more comment from this side. Please identify yourself so that we all get to know you. Oh, oh myself. Yes, I'm uh, Kemo Saliabao from Sierra Leone. <laughs> I'm a professor here. Yeah. In, uh, in the US. You see, there is a contradiction here. The contradiction is that um, we agree we need DDT for agriculture, we need DDT to expel mosquitoes. But the DDT comes from Europe. Hmm. And we talk about control in it, it cannot be controlled because they, they keep on sending them to Africa especially to West Africa and East Africa. And also, we're talking about peace education. The Bradford Program, if you see the link, you go and you study that thoroughly. Look, education is so important to get DDT for mosquitoes and others under control because people are educated to know the harmful effects of these things. They will not really continue to use it, even when the business people in Europe keep on sending them. And the whole point here is, I, I mean, for our program today, for peace, I feel it's a nice thing you have integrated all of them, for people to be educated, to understand, for you to live in peace, you should have thorough understanding of all those things that have harmful effects on you and your people. Thank you, Dick. Yep. Well, we're going to move from the fields um, to technology. And our third presenter is Dr. Nathan Eagle, who's the CEO of an organization called Text Eagle or TXT Eagle? I'm calling it Text Eagle. Text Eagle. Um, and, um, He's a guy who's trying to figure out how we use um, computational tools and technology to improve social development. And with that brief introduction, Nathan, please. Thanks. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure being here. I'm, uh, I'm trying to wean myself off this, the crutch of PowerPoint, and so uh, you're going to have to bear with me if I, if I start rambling a little bit. Um, but... Um, but I think it's actually lucky that, that I decided not to prepare something because now I, I think I, I have a better idea of, uh, of what might be interesting to this particular audience. And, um, and really, my, these, these remarks are really going to be three bullet points. Um, in, in terms of the good news that I think are, is coming from Africa, one, one is data. Uh, so the, I uh, have kind of built my career around studying massive data sets data sets involving hundreds of millions of people, uh, data sets whether that they're from financial transactions or from mobile phones, from mo human movement patterns, um, that's, that's what I do as an academic. And uh, the good news in my opinion is that the majority of the data that's left in the wake of human activity um, is about the developing world. I mean, that's, that's something that I think most people don't recognize 
But you know, when, when we live our lives in this day, whether we're living it in Boston or living it in a small village on the coast of Kenya, um, you know, that, that, uh, the activity that you, you do there, it generates data. And, um, and what I think is exciting is that while there's all sorts of horrible things that can be done with that data in terms of the big brother contexts, there's not a lot of people on the other side of the fence saying, like, let's start thinking about what the good things that can be done with this data are, um, especially in regions that don't necessarily have, um, you know, or the traditional urban planning or traditional disease control. How can we start thinking about leveraging this data that, at the end of the day, is a fact of life for living, you know, living anywhere on this planet? How can we start leveraging this data to do social good? So I'll have a, a couple different, um, I can talk a little bit about how, uh, how I'm trying to do that, uh, working with, I, I work with virtually every mobile phone operator in East Africa and dozens around the world. I help them analyze what's called CDR, called data records. Um, they're interested in understanding the underlying dynamics of, of their, subs their subscribers. Um, and, uh, and I give them some uh, basic tools about how do you analyze graphs of, of this order of magnitude. But um, I do it for free, and I do it for free because I, I get to publish and I get to sh demonstrate how this data can be repurposed um, to help, whether it's uh, urban planners in Nairobi trying to figure out where to put the next latrines in the, in the slubs in Kibera, or uh, where to build the next roads in Kigali in Rwanda. Um, there's a lot of different projects that, that can become possible. There's a lot of good that can be done. Uh, with the, the massive amounts of data that are just getting uh, spewed as exhaust from, from these emerging uh, countries, these emerging markets, these developing um, nations. So data is, is one bullet point. Uh, education is another bullet point. So I, I moved to Kenya in uh, the beginning of 2006 uh, with the help of the, you know, the State Department. I was part of the faculty at MIT. Um, but what I was trying to do is start a mobile phone, mobile phone programming curriculum, originally at the University of Nairobi. And uh, when I started teaching that class, I was really pleasantly surprised by the amount of interest that uh, was there amongst the students and also the faculty. And, uh, and you know, within a few months, I started teaching the same class at, uh, at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. And then I started teaching that class in Makarere in, in Uganda, and then Kigali Institute of Science and Technology in Rwanda. And then I was traveling down to Mozambique, to South, uh, South Africa. Um, and I spent you know, most of 2007 on an airplane, going back and forth, uh, teaching these classes. And, um, and came to the realization that this was not a sustainable thing for me to be doing. Uh, and, uh, and so now I've really been focusing on training faculty, computer science faculty, in these uh, computer science departments across Sub-Saharan Africa um, to, uh, to be able to teach mobile phone application development. And what's exciting is we've now got a curriculum that's, uh, that's being taught in 15 countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. We've got a team of 30 uh, university faculty members and, uh, and we've trained thousands of African computer scientists how to develop mobile phone apps. Uh, and these applications uh, are, are, are really designed for the native market. This is not, these are not applications designed by some poor Finn suffering through a long Scandinavian winter, right? And you know, so you, you go to these countries and you see these old school Nokia phones. And, um, and frankly, I, the, I know a lot, of, I mean, Nokia is, is a benefactor of mine. They fund a lot of my work. Um, but the guys who are developing these apps, I mean, they're much more interested in trying to do a Bluetooth sync to Microsoft Outlook than they are trying to figure out how to give market prices that are relevant to, to local people in, in a rural village in Uganda. So in my opinion, like, you really want to tap into uh, the local developer community, the computer science community in each of these local markets. And, uh, and the good news is my best students at a place like the University of Nairobi are on par in terms of their expertise and their competence with my best students at MIT. Like, there are some amazingly off-the-charts bright kids in, uh, in, these, in these big computer science departments across sub-Saharan Africa. And what's funny is that these are the guys that rarely get good grades. In fact, the guys who are getting the worst grades in the CS departments are by far and away the most competent and because they're working five other jobs. Um, they're basically, they're, they're making an order of magnitude more money than their parents are, and, and, and frankly, it's just, it's hard to keep them to, interested in class at all. And, uh, and I think that's, le that's a legitimate, I mean, if I were one of them, I could kind of see why, uh, why I wouldn't care about getting a CS degree as well. I mean, you're, I don't, at, at the moment, you're not learning 
the things that you can uh, immediately monetize. And so part of the curriculum that I've, I've tried to put together is really has an entrepreneurial slant. Uh, so we, we tell, not only do we equip students with the, the skills they need to, to program phones, but they, we equip them with the, the connections to the, this kind of nascent venture community. Uh, so how do, you, how, do you start a, how do you start a company? Um, you know, let's talk about business plans, business models, recognizing opportunities within a market. Um, and what's exciting is that out of this, this curriculum, out of these thousands of uh, computer science who, students who have gone through and, and generated hundreds of mobile phone applications specifically for their local markets, uh, we've had quite a few successful startups uh, based out of Addis, Kigali, Nairobi, and elsewhere. Um, and I, I mean, I can, I can go on and on about the, I mean, there's, there's one startup in particular that I just love. A, a student of mine, Jeff Gasana, um, built a, uh, a system that enables people to pay for electricity in, uh, in Rwanda. And uh, he basically tapped into the scratch card market. So in all of these markets, if you go, if you want to use a mobile phone, you have to buy one of these scratch cards. They're sold everywhere. There's, uh, you know, thousands of, uh, of scratch card vendors, essentially entrepreneurs who buy these airtime. And, um, and what Jeff tapped into was that he recognized that virtually any commodity could be sold like airtime. And so um, he started printing his own scratch cards, but it was for electricity rather than for, for airtime. And now um, over a quarter of Rwandans pay for the electricity using their mobile phone with Jeff's system. It's, it's, really, it's really transformed a lot of that, that, uh, that region. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of, uh, of his success. Um, the other company that came out of, out of this type of work was, was my own. Uh, it's a, a company that actually started from a student project. Uh, I was, so I moved to Kenya in 2006. I, I ended, up, um, ended up getting, uh, getting forcefully request to leave at the beginning of 2008 by the State Department uh, due to the violence that was going on during the, the recent the Kenyan elections. Um, but during my, the two years I was living there, um, I was working at a local district hospital on the coast of Kenya, called, a place called Khalifi, uh, while I wasn't uh, in Kenya, or while I wasn't on planes or uh, teaching at the University of Nairobi. And um, one of the things that's interesting about Khalifi, it's a beautiful village, uh, but uh, it, it, it also happens to have, or at least at one point, it happened to have the highest endemic rate of malaria in the world. Uh, so during the rainy seasons, a large fraction of the population of Khalifi uh, was infected with malaria. and um, and well, there, there's, there's a couple reasons why I bring that up. One was that I was following my girlfriend and now my wife at the time who got a really great job at this malaria research institute and, you know, in the middle of some rural African village and I had to convince MIT that um, I should be able to uh, go there and they should keep paying me to do something. Uh, that's something that I ended up doing was really just being admin, kind of a you know, support staff for, uh, for the hospital. Um, and, but uh, one of the things that it opened my eyes to was just the inefficiencies in the medical system. Uh, so periodically, I got approached uh, to, um, f for, for blood. And so Khalifi is between Mombasa in the south and Malindi in the, in the north, the two largest uh, coastal Kenyan cities. And you've got these things called matatus, these vans that they just try to stuff as full of people, and then they drive as fast as they can back and forth between these two, uh, these two big cities, and inevitably there's crashes, and, uh, and inevitably, inevitably the Khalifi Local District Hospital uh, bears the brunt of some of them. And, uh, and so they run out of blood at the local blood bank. And, um, and, and I found that they, uh, you know, w when I was there after about no more than three weeks, I get approached by a panicked nurse saying, we desperately need your blood, there's been a big traffic accident, we you need to have some transfusions. And, um, and I, I hate needles. Uh, like needles are something that I, 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 I really have a problem with, but at the end of the day, it's an emergency, right? And, you know, there's, there's, this is something you have to do, and you do it. Um, but uh, when this happened regularly, you know, virtually every month I was there, at about month three or four, I started looking into what the deal was. Like, what, what is the problem here? Why do you keep needing my blood? Um, <laughs> And it, it, what, the issue was this, uh, this kind of latency associated with um, figuring out when these local district hospitals were going to run out of blood. So um, what happens is you've got this guy in Mombasa, the centralized blood bank, who, who drives his truck around to each of the 12 different hospitals on the, in his jurisdiction, and he records the blood levels. 
and then two weeks later, if they're if they're below a certain threshold, he'll he'll do another tour and replenish those those blood the, the blood supply. That that means there's a latency of four weeks there between when you have a massive emergency and when you actually get replenished. Like that's in my opinion unacceptable. Um, and so what we built is a little system, an SMS system uh, that we called SMS Blood Bank that enabled the rural the local rural nurses to text in what the current blood levels are every day. And uh, I had a student of mine, Eric Magatu, at the University of Nairobi build a beautiful interface that uh, showed, visualized what the current blood levels were so these guys at the centralized blood bank in Mombasa could log in and see in real time where, where the, uh, what the current blood levels are and where, where, the, uh, where the blood was needed, essentially, to optimize this, this trip that they were taking. And uh, I thought this was a very clever system. I thought this was, I was quite proud of myself for being able to come up with something that I thought would you know, make life a lot better. Um, but it was a total failure. Like it didn't work at all. We had nurses come in and they, they initially were texting in and they used it for a few days, texting in what the current blood levels were and then they just stopped using it. So we had the guys in Mombasa who were religiously checking it and like loved the interface and were very excited about using their computer. Um, but the nurses in these rural hospitals simply didn't, didn't want to participate anymore. Do people, does anyone have a guess why it, it failed? Too busy is one, is one thing, but it's, it, it, it's not that. I mean, they, like, again, they, they, were, they were very much buying into the fact that they would love to get this information to them so that they don't have to do these transfusions. So, like, so sending a text, they're not too busy to send a text message. Any other ideas? That's, there it is. So, uh, so we were asking these rural district nurses to send a text message every single day. You know, for, um, for a nurse, like that represents a large fraction of their day's wage. Um, that's not acceptable. And, uh, and, and naively, like this is the, it took me a while to figure out what, what the deal was, but that, that turned out to be the deal. And so we added, um, we actually, we, in that system, we added 15 lines of code. And those 15 lines of code compensated the, uh, the rural nurse with about five cents worth of airtime, a little bit more than the cost of a text message for, um, for, the pro for a properly formatted text message telling us what the blood levels were. And that flipped a switch. Like suddenly, we had all of these nurses wanting to participate in the system. They, would, they, had, they were able to buy in. They felt like they were getting compensated. They could see the value that they were having. And, uh, and it didn't cost them anything. And, um, and what's exciting is now that this system is, is being under review by the, uh, the Kenyan uh, Ministry of Health for nationwide deployment because we've been able to show that, you know, by compensating people, we're able to get them to feel empowered and be able to start, you know, you know collecting data in this case. And so that, that kind of leads to this last good news. So I talked about, you know, data. Well, I can uh, a little bit, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about data if I have time. Talked about education, these great uh, computer science departments and these great students. Um, this last, the last point of good news uh, comes down to this, this anecdote about these rural district uh, nurses. The fact that you can start compensating people in remote communities uh, for work that they do. Like, that is, I think, profound. Um, and so uh, it's gotten me, since, since we launched this in 2000, the end of 2007, it's gotten me thinking almost every day, what other types of work can we get people to do um, where we can actually compensate them? And the exciting thing about doing this in Kenya is that you've got something called M-Pesa, which is mobile money. Uh, it enables people to send and receive money on their, on their phones. And the, uh, the amazing thing about M-Pesa is that uh, yeah, it's kind of happened by accident. Um, Safaricom saw that people were using airtime as a kind of a surrogate for currency. Uh, Safaricom's the incumbent operator in Kenya, and so they let you know they decided that they would launch their own little mobile money system. And uh, within eight months, Safaricom became the largest bank in East Africa. Like suddenly, they've tapped into this market where this, these individuals who don't have uh, necessarily the, the means to get traditional financial tools are using their mobile phones to, to do savings to, um, you know, as essentially a surrogate for a credit card. And, um, and the, the empowering thing for me about that is that from my, you know, actually from my iPhone or my laptop, uh, I can send uh, denominations as low as $1 
uh, to virtually any of our 7 million users in Kenya right now with zero latency and very little friction I mean, in terms of the, what the, the, the surcharge is. So, so in an automated way, I can start compensating a massive workforce. And, um, and so we've built a company around this. We've, been enabled, we've enabled people to um, start earning money both on their phones and uh, on their desktop computers. Um, and uh, we're, we're doing a wide range of different outsourcing work uh, related to things like form processing, audio transcription, translation. Um, it's pretty exciting. I mean, the, the market for outsourcing is a $20 billion market, and I think we're really we're poised to, uh, to over, you know, overthrow it, really. Um, we're now, uh, I think we're one of the largest employers in Kenya at the moment. Uh, I, we're going to be the largest employer definitely in, in the next two months. We're overtaking a, you know, a, a large tea plantation. We're going to have about 10,000 active workers. Uh, we've scaled this to Rwanda, South Africa. We're launching in India and China and the Philippines in June. Um, it's a model that I think is really fundamentally empowering because as opposed to traditional outsourcing where you've got this normal, I mean, you've essentially got back office work that you're funneling to a giant warehouse full of uh, computers and people in Bangalore. We're, we're leveling the, fl the playing field even more. We're enabling anyone with a mobile phone, anyone with access to a, a desktop computer at a cyber cafe to start, to start doing work and start earning money, regardless of your religion or gender or age. Um, you know, it, it enables, it, it basically opens the door up for uh, for, for virtually anyone to participate in a, in a global economy. And, um, and I can't pretend to know, you know what kind of work people are gonna be doing on their phones in the future. Um, but I have a, a, just a fundamental belief that, that this, uh, this idea, whether it's us or someone else, but this idea of distributed work is going to play a, just a profound role in the lives of a large fraction of the world's population today. And it's uh, exciting to become part of that. So I've been told I have a couple minutes left. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Questions specifically to Nathan before we open it up to the whole panel? Please. Can you identify yourself, please? Uh, my name is Ann Crane. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Ann Crane. I'm interested in um, education, particularly in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the practical applications of uh, cell phones and education. I know there was a, a conference on e-learning in Dakar last year, and there's another one coming up in Zambia next month. Could you speak a little bit more about that in detail? Sure, you probably I, were involved the, the, in that. The caveat <laughs> is that that's not my area, right? So, I, so I, 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 I teach mobile phone programming, but I certainly don't use, uh, I don't teach it via the mobile phone. Um, and I think what you're alluding to is, can, can we start pushing out lessons plans via SMS or, or kind of a low-level WAP type thing? And, um, and that's not something I've, I've, I've done in the past. It's something that we're thinking about for Text Eagle, though, the, the, the outsourcing company, mainly as a way to get people into higher paying jobs. So you have to start, like we, right now we have a standardized test, if you can spell or not. Uh, if you can spell, then you take the translation test. If you can translate, then you do X, Y, and Z. And, and we're showing that as, as, as you, as, as you, can, um, as you can demonstrate higher and higher education, you can earn more and more money. And this is not a philanthropic reason. We're not demonstrating this to keep people in school. I love that that's a secondary effect, but we're just demonstrating it because our clients will pay more for these, this higher value work. Um, and so we're trying to figure out a way to assess, assess whether or not people have that competence. The next step, ultimately, is, is trying to build that competence from the handset itself. Um, and uh, it's certainly on our agenda, but it's not something we're active, we haven't done yet, so. This is, this is a fascinating p potential sort of, as we play that into a longer term future. I'm wondering why the geography of Kenya, Tanzania has this banking system, the mobile network. You don't find it in Ethiopia. You don't find it other well, places. Well, Ethiopia is a mess. Like, see, well, the ETC well, that, is horrible. I can, I can rant that's about my, that's my why, question. how ETC why is Why one so place and not another? So. Well, okay. So, um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I tend to get, uh, like, well, I, I'm, I'm really upset with, uh, with Ethiopia for a lot of reasons, for the, the government. Um, 
I mean, all right, so, so for example, I said I was going to teach uh, this SMS boot camp in, in Addis. Um, I get halfway through my first lecture, someone raises their hands and, uh, and says, like, actually, I mean, this is all illegal. You're, you're not allowed to send text messages. Uh, that, that is just so backward. I mean, they were using it um, originally to, I mean, the, the, the reason was simply that people were using it to, uh, to organize demonstrations, um, and, uh, and the government decided that the, the people shouldn't have text messages, and the government decided that they should own the operator. And so if you look at mobile handset penetration in Ethiopia versus, you know, just going south to Kenya, it's just you know, black and white. I mean, it's, it's amazing. There's just so few, I mean, I had to pay $45 to get a SIM card in Addis. Um, well, you know, I had someone literally put a SIM card into my hand as I'm getting into a taxi in Nairobi. Like, they, they're giving away SIM cards. Um, like, it's such a cutthroat market uh, that, uh, that suddenly you can, you can buy an unlocked GSM phone uh, in a place called Cell Phone Alley, which is kind of a back corner in Nairobi. Uh, you can buy an unlocked, unlocked GSM phone, which is a black market phone typically from Dubai, for under $10. You get the SIM card for free, and you can buy a scratch card for about 25 cents. You know, so that's the Kenyan market, and that has enabled, I mean, so now to be a day, day laborer in that community, I mean, the guys who are digging ditches on the side of the road, I mean, you have to have a phone. I mean, day labor is organized via SMS, and it's really been transformative, whereas you go to Addis, and it's, it's basically the wealthy elite who, uh, who have the handsets, and it's, you, know, you have not had that trickle-down thing whatsoever. Uh, in terms of the mobile ma money, I mean, I, so you, you got me on a tangent on Ethiopia, um, but, but mobile money is being, is being roll rolled out in virtually all of the sub-Saharan African markets that I work in now. Uh, they, everyone has an M-Pesa-like equivalent that, that should, be, uh, should be launched within the next six to maybe 18 months. It's, it's hard, though. I mean, there's a lot of, of these types of services that have launched and failed. The reason why m succeeded is because of Safaricom's investment in human capital. What they did is they trained something like 2,500 m agents. These are human ATMs that, uh, that essentially go out into, these, uh, into virtually every village in Kenya and, and run these tra transactions. These are similar to the guys who are selling scratch cards. Um, but you need that infrastructure. You need a way to get cash out of the system in, in the remote, remote parts of the country. And, uh, and that's why other mobile money systems have failed, is that they, no one's made that investment in the human infrastructure. Do you pay the mobile um, ATMs on their phones? Yeah, well, so, so the, the, the M-Pesa agent works for Safaricom, but they get a cut of the, uh, of the transaction. Yeah. Yeah. It's back to incentivizing for, yeah. for rural labor. Other, please, and then one more over here. The, the biggest industry in Africa now is mobile phones. And it's very difficult. You get to even the smallest villages, you see mobile phones there. But no development. And what is happening? Um, the mobile phone companies, they are so rich. And they're exploiting the people so much that a lot of us will really want to see what the mobile phone companies in Europe, in America here could do to start developing those countries, especially the infrastructural development. How can you have a mobile phone in a village where you have to walk four hours to get there? Oh, sorry. So is your, your question is, uh, in terms of GSM penetration, you're saying that, the, that there's not enough civic signal strength in these rural communities? Is that? No, 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 no. I'm talking about development on the ground. Oh, I see. So, so, so you yes, have you access to phone. you can have the mobile phones. The mobile phones are everywhere. Yeah. My, my village is like uh, four miles away from the next hospital. Uh -huh. You have to walk to go there. Walk to the hospital. Yeah. 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 But you have mobile phones. Yep. But and if somebody is seriously walk. sick, you have to put a person in a hammock to take him there. Yeah. yeah. But the mobile phones are everywhere. You have put your giant uh, things everywhere for the company to make more money on these people. Uh, I, uh, sure. I, what I, do you I, think I, you, like, you can do about that? <laughs> <laughs> Like, so this is, I think it's a mistake that you get, you get a lot of people who arm wave about how mobile phones will save everything. Uh, like, you know, that I, I think it's much better to have clean water than a cell tower, right? I mean, that's, there, there's, a, there's, there's a given that, or, or, good, or, or education, I mean, there's, there's a wide range of different things. The interesting thing about the telecommunication um, 
revolution in sub-Saharan Africa is that, uh, is that it's, these large corporations have found that it's, it's profitable to invest in infrastructure in Africa. And I don't know of another time where that's ever been shown. Like this is the, as far as I know, this is one of the first times where you've showed like, look, if we make this infrastructure investment, building out infrastructure, we can recoup our costs. And that's, and that at the, that's, it's, it was not, it has nothing to do with um, doing good, helping the people. Um, I mean, it has to do with their bottom line of making money. And, uh, and so, and, and so we kind of stumbled upon that. Uh, but but I don't I don't you, it's a mistake to think that these mobile phone operators are interested in and in, and in, in doing a massive you know community service for the regions where they operate they they care first and foremost about their bottom line and that's and that's really it let me let me suggest we have one from this side one in the middle and one in the back but why don't we just now open it up to the full panel if we could so thank you Nathan uh, for my name is Paul um, my question or maybe my comment is directed to Mr. Ego. Great initiative that you have in Kenya. Uh, are you aware that I think what you are, uh, the program that you explain, uh, you must know probably Ushahidi. Uh, yeah. They started that program uh, right after the post election in Kenya. Are you working in any way with the Oreo Coro or the team from Ushahidi? Yeah, I, 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 they're, they're friends of mine. I mean, we don't do, like, so I, I, I don't collect data about, uh, about civil unrest or natural disasters or that sort of thing. So, I mean, we don't, our, our, we, we're not necessarily aligned in terms of the types of projects that we're working on, but we use the same types of technology and, and we, we chat on a regular basis, so. Maybe just a follow-up, but I think the future truly also of Africa, like in Kenya, we just laid all this fiber optic, a uh, lot of money uh, input into it. But I think the future truly will be uh, re-educating the people what that means, what this system can do for them. Because uh, if we don't do that, then we will have all the companies from Europe, uh, again, coming because they're ahead of uh, technology and uh, setting up the companies, nothing wrong with that. But I think we, we do need um, a balance in there. In the middle here, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. There is a parallel program in Niger called Project ABC that uses uh, local languages, uh, Hausa, for example, to educate rural farmers using the cell phone. Uh, so through Hausa, Zarma, and it's having effect, I think it's funded by either the State Department or one of those uh, government programs, in uh, training local farmers, providing them with knowledge in their own languages, you know, with respect to farming, you know, health, et cetera, et cetera. So I was wondering if, I mean, and I see there a very big potential in terms of education uh, would you, did you have any experience in that yeah, field? Yeah, I mean, I, I really worry about those types of projects. I, 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 can, I can give you a, literally a dozen projects that are doing things like let's, let's help farmers get advice about what to, you know, what to plant, you know, what kind of um, you know, insecticides to use, what to do if you have an infestation of X, Y, or Z. Um, my concern about those projects is typically they're run by companies that have no experience farming in Africa, uh, but rather they're, they're, they, they feel like, well, this, we, we've got this technology, we should be able to help people. Um, let's figure out, let's, let's, let's help farmers farm better. Uh, when and you're catering, to, I mean, the, 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 pers the, the group that you're trying to help has been farming in that area for, for you know, their entire lives. I mean, if talk about the experts. Um, that, like they're the experts, and so I think really it, it's I, I think it's important to start thinking about how these systems can can not just broadcast information about what to do, but rather have have that information come from the bottom up. So if you can enable uh, farmers to be able to talk about what's working and what's not working, if you can build that community, if you can get the experts in the field to, uh, to, to be that, that annoying guy on these bulletin boards and the internet who are always trying to answer every question, if you can build that type of community, but in, that, in, the, in the rural farming uh, place in, in Niger or elsewhere, that's where it gets interesting. It, I, in my opinion, though, the, the vast majority of projects are taking a top-down approach, which is the wrong way to do it. In the back corner, and then we'll come forward here. Hi, uh, my name is Herbert. I'm from Uganda, actually next door to Kenya. And uh, last time I went home, I refused to buy a cell phone because for me, it's growth, but it's not development, like the gentleman there said. Um, uh, my question to 
Mr. Uh, to, okay, to Ego, is what do you, how do you see Africa? Is it as a source of uh, gain or uh, like a, as a partner? Um, here, I have waited for 30 minutes on a landline, waiting to hear back from a bank or, you know. So if you sell cell phones to Africa, they'll be paying every cent, I mean, for every minute of that. Yep. It's not a good thing. And uh, so in Africa, we say, well, you, have, you, are, you are taking milk from the cow, but you are not feeding the cow. So eventually, the cow will die, and you will also die. That's my comment. I, well, I mean, uh, again, I, it comes down to whether or not these, these corporations are, are putting, putting cell phone towers and in, investing the hundreds of millions of dollars that is required to operate a network um, for, to make money or to do social good. And it's, it is to make money. Um, I, I would push back to some degree on uh, the fact that they are adding some value. I mean, they're not actively doing development, but being able to give people a, a means of communicating uh, and not just, no longer a means of communicating, but a means of money transfer has improved the lives of a huge number of people. And for example, like, I, like so, you know, uh, the, the, the people I was working with in Nairobi, traditionally what they did was they, they would, uh, they were working in the city and they wanted to send money to their family up country. And what the, the way that you do that is you, you uh, put your cash money in an envelope, uh, you write the amount on it, you give it to a taxi cab driver that you trust, and he drives it to your family. Like, that is how money transfer has been done. Or you pay Western Union a ridiculous amount of money to, to do that type of transfer. Uh, with, with something like M-Pesa, that it's become much, much cheaper to, uh, to be able to send money to your friends and family. Uh, and I think that, that has added value. And that not only has added value to people who are sending money to family, but it also enables people um, the ability to start saving money. Again, you know, a lot of these traditional societies, where I was living on the coast of Kenya, no one had bank accounts, but if you had extra money, you would start um, buying blocks for your house. You're, you would invest in, in your house, and you'd have these coral blocks. And the, you'd buy more coral blocks, and you'd start building out your house. Or you'd buy livestock. But uh, like, you would never, you'd never try to set up some type of bank account, or at least the, the vast majority of people in that village didn't. But now being able to start collect, uh, accumulating money via this piece of technology, um, it, it, it has meant that, uh, that, that individuals who no longer, uh, well, it, it, it's given people a way to start getting at least introduced to a more traditional and I think a better way of, of doing financial savings than, uh, than investing in livestock or bu building block or buying blocks. So I, 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 I don't know, I think yeah, you know, ultimately, it, it, the system was not was put in place for these corporations to make money, um, but I think th that it, it, it's doing more good than bad. Let's come to the front table here, and then we'll go back to you at the back table, and then move in this direction. Abdul Paliwala from Warwick and Tanzania, originally. Um, I, would, I sense a kind of uh, bifurcation of themes coming through here. And I just wondered if, if uh, Richard and um, uh, Nathan and uh, Seble could comment on this, because on the one hand, there is a kind of very much a, a, a people's social struggle uh, kind of theme to it, and, and a, a kind of educational theme. Um, and on the other hand, there is very much a, a, an entrepreneurial evangelism. Um, and it, I sense that each of you are saying these is, you know, all, all these are positive directions. Um, are, are they inevitably bifurcating, or are we talking about different aspects of the same reality? That, that there is a positive dimension in working through very much social struggles, like, for example, pesticides, peace. Uh, which are not necessarily financial, and the others, and the financial related one, um, entrepreneurial one, is also moving in the same direction. Um, I think it's more than bifurcated. It may, it may be trifurcated. It may, you know, all kinds of kinds of conflicts may be going on at the same time. 
um, around, you know, sort of what is good for Africa, not just, you know, what's the good news in Africa, but what is good for Africa. Um, but, the, you know, the realities for sort of from the perspective of conflict and, and the kinds of um, really uh, high static lives that a lot of Africans lead, part of it is, okay, all this exploitation, and I don't mean you're singularly responsible for corporate exploitation in Africa, but of course there's tremendous, tremendous corporate exploitation in Africa by Westerners and by Africans. Um, that creates uh, tremendous social and economic tensions and political tensions. And um, having said that, I mean, I think there's also a tremendous responsibility on behalf of Africans to have an analysis of the ways in which they open their markets um, and the ways in which they, they systematically hamstring their educational system so that they're fundamentally uh, really inexpensive daycare zero through 12, nobody's learning anything. I mean, they're learning in shifts. You, you talk about telephones in Ethiopia, you should look at the schools. They, they, they go to school in three shifts, nobody learns anything. They just sit there, hang out with their friends, hang out with their teacher, and then they go home. And we're talking, I mean, sorry, this is not good news, 24, you know, 50 years, my retirement is gonna be hell, in, you know, if, if, if I'm retiring in Africa, because what, what are we building? So I think for me, the issues are, are much bigger than simply bifurcated. I think we have, um, there needs to be a conversation among Africans about sort of colonialism is a reality. It isn't something that ended um, sort of when the Europeans pulled their bodies out. You know, they, they left their companies, they left their ethos, they left their values. Um, we're using their values to build our um, uh, safari comms, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we need an analysis of the ways in which we participate in the exploitation of, of, of our continent and of, and of our societies and of our people. And we're creating a population of people who cannot possibly have an analysis. Um, and, and the kinds of things we talk about is how we lack this and how we lack that and how we lack the other thing. The other day I was reading um, how the, the Ethiopian government has given some of the most fertile land available to European corporate um, agriculturists to grow food to export to Europe. And they're allowing them to tap into the water table that's going to undermine all these farms in the area, all these local farms. I mean, it's catastrophic. And, and yet it's not new, because a number of years ago, the Senegalese gave the Chinese the right to fish with these enormous trawlers where they just swallow the ocean in one end of the boat and then they release the water on the other end and every fish in the sea is inside this boat and it's, easy, it's cheaper to eat chicken in Dakar than it is to eat fish. You know, we negotiated those terms of trade. You know, sort of, you know, Europeans didn't just come and say, you know, we need to take all your fish. So we really have to have an analysis of the ways in which we do things. You want to comment on that? Well, it's a hard, uh, I don't have much to add. Actually, that was brilliant, I think. And uh, critical thinking is evident here in this room. Growth is not necessarily development. I mean, I think that's the way forward. I'll do, with permission, I'm going to try and run this session an extra seven or eight minutes, given the number of people with comments. We'll go to the back, uh, then to the middle, <laughs> then right up here, and then Adil, I'll give you the right of last question as one of the organizers. Drinking mine. Oh, I'm sorry, and one more to the right. So if we could keep the questions succinct so we can get as many in. Um, hello, I'd like to thank all the panelists for being here today. My name's Randy and I'm currently in Boston. Um, and I had a question as we talk about uh, essentially the transfer of financial systems to mobile technology and services. Um, given that many of the inherent banking and financial systems throughout Sub-Saharan Africa are inherently inequitable, for example, the West African safe is still tied to the euro, and it's not a floating currency. Um, so I'm getting the empowerment factors of dispersing financial services to everyone that has a phone, but I see problems where we're essentially transferring financial control from suspect state institutions and banks to telecoms, which can really be owned and operated by anyone. Um, so do any of you have any insight on, you know, where we go with that, potential oversight, and, you know, how we curb uh, the potential of this being the same equation with a different face? 
Can I actually suggest let's get all the comments or questions out and then we'll give the panelists an opportunity to make some last remarks. So I think you've been waiting patiently and then I'll come back to you and then come over to this side. Okay. Um, Mark Summers from U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, I, I just thought that what Nathan's ideas made me think of two things. One is that this, the, the cell phones are so important to people in rural areas because it's a way for people that are living in isolated places to feel connected to modern life and there's such an interest in that. There's quite a deep interest in that. So this, this is something that there's, there's a real pull towards cell phones, which he's locking into. But another part of this, I think, in my research, in, in many parts of Africa, is a deep suspicion of banks. And it's interesting to me, I mean, people wouldn't put money in a bank if it was next door to their house, because they don't trust it. They don't think they're going to get the money back, they're going to get taken advantage of. And that's, that's widespread. And so I find it interesting that um, not treating, uh, trusting these um, established institutions, what they might be trusting are, is this new innovation with, um, you know, banking or exchanging money through cell phones. It's, um, it's kind of, I don't know what, this, what the significance is, but it certainly is a statement about the status quo. Thank you. Thanks. Here and then we'll move across the room. No, please, go, oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had the question. No, no. no. all right. You had the microphone. <laughs> yeah. um, I brought a question that comes up in this. My name's Tim Longman, and I'm here at BU. Is um, about the sort of role, as Professor Dawit was beginning to talk about, um, what's the role of the West in some of these developments, and what's the role of Africa itself and Africans. But specifically, I was interested, uh, Professor Dawit, when you're talking about university programs, specifically peace, peace programs, um, there's a tendency for a lot of study abroad programs to be sort of drop-in programs where American students go and learn and don't really give much back. Um, on the other hand, you mentioned that there are some programs that are African programs. To what extent are there attempts to bridge that divide? To what extent is there any capacity building that's being done by programs, say American programs that are going into Africa and also training African students or encouraging interaction? So. Can you hold that and we'll give you I the sure last can. comment. So let's collect from the back. Sorry, I just wanted to go right. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Julius Gatune uh, from Kenya. Uh, quite excited to, with, with the work being done on cell phones, and I think uh, probably that's the right way because it's tapping on entrepreneurism and I also have to comment, I actually taught at the Computer Science Department, University of Nairobi. And my one of my concerns was that we were not doing enough to give the kids practical tools to go out there and do things. We started doing that, and I'm quite happy to, to see what you've done. And, and I want to comment, really, we can complain about cell phones, we can complain about uh, all these multinationals exploiting us, but really, it's entrepreneurial spirit that we, we, we are seeing. That's, that's the other part of the coin. Cell phones are tools. In Kenya conflict in 2008, cell phones were key in fueling that conflict. If you saw the SMSs being sent just before the election violence, they were totally poisonous. But we, don't, we cannot blame the cell phones for that because it empowers people. We can use it. I think we, we should try to do things, then from there, try to find out how we can regulate, how we can control it. Because I think cell phones have done a lot and they're going to do a lot. And they are the tools that Kenya now, we are the cutting edge, actually. The M-Pesa program he talked about is now being rolled out in other, even in Europe, I think. I saw in Eastern Europe, they're using the same model. Technology, innovation coming from Africa, finally, and being exported elsewhere. And I think that is, uh, that's a good news, really. Yep. And we should celebrate that. Thank you. Can we take the comment from the side here? I, I don't need microphone. Professor David, I don't need microphone. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Uh, Professor Doit, I couldn't agree with you more, but and I, and but I want I want to say something. We're missing a big population here. We're missing the Chinese. Between 2000 and 2010, 27 land deals were signed between China and and, and governments in Africa, and what I think is that the only way the Africans are going to really benefit as much as they can. I think it's not a bad thing, but they need to organize because each country is too small to bargain on its own. But it doesn't see. But I don't see that happening. So when and how can that happen? 
All right, can I suggest, all right, we'll, we'll take one more from the floor and then we'll give our panelists the last word. Oh, and then Adil, I was gonna give you a question. Okay, my name is Ade Ifedi, I'm from Nigeria. And then I work with um, community-based projects around my country, working with undergraduates in universities. And um, I want to add to the comment a gentleman made over there in terms of how do we build capacity. With everything we are talking about, I think that the key here is that there is some kind of knowledge on ground already. And it is important that we should exploit this knowledge and build local capacity, because that's the only way that we can grow internally from Africa. So my question is, in terms of building capacity, and not just coming to, you know, somebody comes from um, the Western world to Africa to try to say what they think we should do, how are we building the local capacity so that people can address the problems who are on ground, who can sustain the solution of those problems? Thank you. What I'm going to suggest, I'm going to allow my panelists, colleagues here, last words and ask them to address the specific comments or questions related to them. Please, Dick. We'll just go down the table. Well, let me just say, this is, this is fun. This is a lively discussion. And uh, this is the hope, as far as I can tell, uh, you know, that the, this kind of ferment is what we will have for the next 50 years. And the, and the solutions will either come from the ground uh, or some bright uh, new development that we maybe don't even anticipate at this point. So um, I hate to be just a Pollyanna, but uh, this is the way forward as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the, the question of the Chinese is a very, very, very interesting and vexing question. And I, and, uh, I, I mean, it's not, I don't know that it's uh, possible to get into it here. I'm, I have my own thoughts about it, which probably are very shocking. Um, I think you know part of the question is part of the problem is is the the, the mistaken um, view by a lot of African states that these are not Europeans that they're going to do something somehow differently that they're coming with a lot of philanthropy attached to the bids for these major contracts. So there's there's a an, another problem of of analysis. I agree with you that there's a need for sort of a, a collective bargaining approach to all of this, but the African states themselves are in competition with one another for all kinds of things, including you know Chinese dollars or Chinese money, whatever you know. So I don't know when they're going to do that. Um, what I know is in the 10 years, I, I mean, I spent 10 years working in sub-Saharan Africa, basically. I'm an attorney. I did pro bono legal work for women's organizations um, trying to sue their countries. And, and I can tell you, I mean, I went into places that I didn't, I didn't think I would find Europeans, and there were Chinese there. And so there's this kind of incredible infiltration of African society that's happening where um, you know, they're, you know, people become your neighbors, they're friends, they're, and then slowly you have a company that arrives. Um, you know, you have a major road builder or, or bridge construction or farming or whatever. So yeah, I mean, I think we really need to have a conversation and a huge conference on just, you know, what exactly is going on. On the question of, of capacity building for, for study abroad, you're absolutely right. Most of the study abroad scenarios are, are really suspect. Um, what you have very often is you have an a, a, a university or college here that has an affiliation with a number of African universities and colleges. The student pays the money here to the institution and only a small fraction of the, of the funds go to the African institution. Um, part of that is, is exactly the problem of capacity. The, the institution, um, the African institution may not have the capacity to communicate with these students on this side. So the American institution is a, you know, acts as a go-between. On the other hand, the, the vast majority of the resources stay here. The other thing is a lot of students and a lot of parents are really loath to go, and go to African programs that are not affiliated with an American university, as if you know, Arcadia University is going to come and airlift your kid out when the inevitable war starts you know, in the country where your kid happens to be. Um, so there's, there's that issue. There's also the ways in which institutions on, you know, sort of hamstring themselves. They don't accredit, they don't give credit for courses that are not passed through an American institution. So you know, I spend a good fourth of my time doing study abroad work, and it's about what is this course, how much credit does it get. If Arcadia says it's OK, it's OK. If SUNY Binghamton says it's OK, it's OK. But if Legon in, in Ghana says it's OK, it's not OK. We have to send a whole team of people over there to see if there's actually a classroom and if there's a curriculum and what's the credit hour. And, you know, so we have really some very serious challenges. 
I think that um, peace studies people are going to start to question those challenges because they because we can talk about sort of uh, we, we can talk about racism, we can talk about um, uh, academic tourism, we can talk about all of these kinds of uh, ideas that will start to get people to think about what kinds of peace studies programs do we want to construct and. I would like to construct a peace studies program between my institution and another institution or a set of institutions where it also goes both ways. For every American student we send to Legon, we bring a Ghanaian student to Goucher first semester. Uh, how we're going to do that, I mean, me and the president are going to have to have a conflict over, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. Dr. Eagle. Okay. Um, yeah, my thoughts on capacity building, I think, really parallel with what's already been stated. Uh, I think it's uh, originally um, this idea of sending MIT students to these different computer science departments uh, was something that we, we considered, um, but ultimately I think it was the, the, the wrong idea. I think the, what we're doing now, this idea of basically teaching the teachers. Uh, getting the professors in these local universities up to speed with the curriculum um, that, uh, that, 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 you know, the mobile phone programming curriculum that they want to learn anyway is, uh, ha has been far more successful in terms of creating a sustainable uh, program that, uh, that has, has shown a lot of growth. Uh, the only issue there is that if, if, if you're asking these professors to go and, and, and teach an additional class, um, I, I get blown away by how, how, how little these sal the salaries are for a place at the, like the University of Nairobi and the Choromo campus teaching uh, computer science classes. Like it's, it's, it's appalling um, how overworked these, the faculty are and uh, how, how poorly compensated they are. And so it's no wonder that the, the teaching suffers and that the, the, the curriculum at the moment is a bit antiquated. So I, I think really we've got to figure out a way to uh, not only train the teachers but get them, more com get them better compensated, make that profession um, a bit more respected and, and so see if we can get uh, even better faculty in the future into these, uh, into these departments. So that's, that's the local capacity. Um, in terms of economic oversight, uh, you know, going from banks to telcos, it's a major problem. Uh, and it's, it's one of these things that uh, I don't, you know, it, it's not going to be solved overnight. The interesting thing, one of the, the other reasons that I, why M-Pesa worked in Kenya is that, um, you know, the, the government officials own a, a, a questionable amount of Safaricom. No one really knows how much, how much they own of that company, but um, the, the central banking regulators in a lot of these other markets have really pulled, uh, you know, especially actually in a place like India, have really pushed the brakes on mobile banking. They don't, want to, they, they don't want that revolution to happen because they want to stay in control of the financial system. Um, because Safaricom was, uh, to some degree, owned by the government, the wheels were greased. And um, for, for better or worse, that they were able to launch it without having uh, the major banks uh, throw too much of a wrench into the works. Um, but, uh, but that said, that is no way, that is, that, that's, that, that's not oversight. That's just a different form of corruption. Um, and, and, it's, and it's something that does, def certainly needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of why, why people are not trusting banks but suddenly tr trusting cell phone providers, I, I think it came from this transition from Simbaza to M-Pesa, for example. You know, this idea of uh, you, people are getting used to buying airtime. When they buy airtime, it doesn't just get automatically removed from their phone without their knowledge. I mean, they, they understand that system, and they can start sending airtime to other people, and then it, you know, it, it builds up a level of trust with the operator that they don't necessarily have with a more formal financial institution. And so when you make that transition from you're no longer sending airtime, you're sending money, um, it, it, I think it became a bit more smooth. Um, in terms of the, uh, the SMS is poisonous, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I, it, it pains me to say that actually one of my former students uh, was working for a political, camp, political campaign in Kenya where we, we taught SMS boot camp and he went out and was one of the guys that was running a, an SMS gateway that was pushing out hate SMS. Uh, you know, he was using the skills that we taught him to do something horrible. And, uh, and, and, you know, I get approached by people telling, you know, and it's true, I get, there, there's, there's part of um, a genocide, uh, or at least a, a massive killing in Sudan that was organized via SMS. Uh, so, you know, people are using SMS the, uh, to, org to group a, round up a large group of people and then, and then kill them, and, uh, and that's absolutely horrible. So, wh when you're, when you're um, faced with these facts that, you know, um, there's a question of what do you do? Uh, and in my mind, what you don't do is you don't stop teaching uh, people how to use the tools. 
Like that, that it's a, mis a you know, I, 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 I'm still as much of an advocate of, of the S SMS uh, boot camps as I always have been. Uh, because you, you, you can't just say, oh, well, you know, you're going to use it for bad. We can't, we can't teach it at the University of Nairobi anymore. Um, and, and then in terms of China, uh, a good friend of mine is actually um, in, in prison right now in Addis Ababa for talking about uh, a, basically a quality report from a company called Huawei, which is, uh, which is a front for the Chinese government. But they, do, they, sell, uh, they sell mobile phone equipment. And, uh, and, and I think this is very much indicative of how China has operated, at least in my experience, is that they, um, they, they buy out government employees and, uh, and then they, they, make, they put pressure on the government to, uh, to make sure that they you know, buy their products, whether they're products, telecommunication products, or whether that's mining. I mean, so you know, China has wired up um, most of the towns in Uganda with fiber. Um, they, you know, there's some amazing roads that have been funded by the Chinese government, um, but uh, but these companies, or these sorry, these countries are are selling the selling what they need most, the their natural resources, and it's a fire sale. And and the and the other problem is that the um, you know more traditional Western companies, you know, we'll take the telecom example as a good one. Um, so Nokia Siemens Networks is another a, a competitor of Huawei. Um, but for a lot of these, and to, to compete in Africa, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that have to be done under the table. You know, to get the last, the last GSM license in Kenya, uh, it, it more or less meant that, um, you know, I think it was something like 50, uh, well, I don't know, it was, it was, some, it was over $100 million, or maybe, maybe it was a bit less than that, but th that's the license fee to start a GSM mobile phone operator. Uh, and the vast majority of that money ends up in some guy's Swiss bank account. And so to, to come out and be an operator, uh, you know, you're basically paying people under the table, and that's ludicrous. And, and, it's, and it has to be stopped. Because think about what, what Kenya could do with $100 million that the operator didn't have to just pay out um, as a bribe. I mean, that's, so I think there's, there's a lot of things that need to be done, um, and corruption is, a, is, a, you know, is the real bane of, of a lot of the work that I do in Sub-Saharan Africa. On, on that note, thank you. Um, this is this is impossible to summarize, um, so I won't um, try it all except for to say, it's good, it's big, and it's hot. And what I mean is there is good news from Africa, and I think we heard some of the examples of that. Um, but within that good news, there are big challenges as to how some of that good news news will be used. And clearly, as this discussion has shown, there will be hot debates. So if I was going to summarize, it's good, big, and hot. I want to thank the panelists. I particularly want to thank the audience and maybe ask if people could keep the break a little bit shorter to get back on time. <laughs>